Hello, viewers and listeners. Today we are talking about respect in relationships uh, with uh, Mike Domitz. Uh, Mike Domitz uh, is uh, the founder uh, of the uh, Center for Respect. Uh, he is also an uh, expert for helping organizations, institutions, the uh, U.S. military, certified speaking uh, professional, uh, author of the books, uh, leading authority, educator, and uh, video blogger. Mike, hello, and welcome to my channel. Thank you, Alexander, for having me. Uh, okay, Mike, uh, uh, in the beginning, I want to ask you about your outstanding books. Uh, tell us, uh, please, about your books briefly. Uh, so, two main books. One is called Voices of Courage. It's 12 survivors of sexual assault sharing their stories. Uh, Ten women, two men. Each take you on the journey from before their assault to after their assault to where they are today. And then the second book is called Can I Kiss You? And that's a thought-provoking look at relationships, intimacy, and sexual assault. So it really teaches consent, healthy relationships, respecting boundaries, how to communicate with our partners, deals with the really fun side and the very serious side. Mike, your books are uh, quite provocative uh, on what actions and thoughts you are trying to push your readers. Uh, it's all about helping people build mutually amazing relationships in all different aspects of their life. So if people are treating each other with respect and a higher standard of mutually amazing relationships, then we don't have sexual violence. We don't have unhealthy relationships. We have everybody, even if they're not meant to be together and they were to leave each other, it's done with respect and with gratitude and led with love instead of anger, coercion, if divisiveness, coercion, guilt, so that's what we're all about, building mutually amazing relationships. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Mike, uh, <clears throat> uh, could you tell us more about your company? Yes, yeah, so what I do is I do programs in schools and in, for businesses and organizations and associations all over the world on a couple different things. If it's for school, they're bringing me to talk to kids about healthy relationships. If it is a business, they're bringing me in to help build a culture of respect where everybody feels valued, everybody feels seen. So I come in and do programs that show how we all, Alexander, can make the mistake of treating a colleague with disrespect and we don't even realize it. Maybe it's we don't answer the question or we roll our eyes, but little aggressions that we do. And what we do is we show how you can take those small moments and choose to take an action of respect in that moment to really help that person be seen. So we do that for companies. And then for US military, we help them reduce sexual violence, create healthy relationships. So it really varies on who I'm working with. Uh, it can also be parents. We have a Facebook group called Mutually Amazing Parents. Really wonderful group where we provide parents resources on building mutual amazing relationships with themselves and their children. Amazing, amazing, Mike. Uh... Okay, Mike, uh, could you tell us uh, an interesting uh, story how someone asking first uh, changed their lives? What's beautiful about this work is we do get to hear from people who have used the information we shared with them that we taught them and came back and shared how they changed their life dramatically, Alexander. So I appreciate you sharing that with me. We've had survivors of sexual violence come up to us and say, after this, this is the first time I realized how strong and courageous I am. And then four years later, we hear back from survivors on choices they made in their life that were completely different and took them down these amazing positive paths because of something they heard in our program or they read. Now, let me be very clear. I didn't do that. That's the survivor taking the information I shared and doing that themselves, right? So I don't change lives. People change their own lives. What I do is I give them the skills and the seeds to be able to plant those changes, but they do it. And so it's really exciting, Alexander, to see that people are able to take what we share and they choose to transform their lives. I've met people that got married based on what they learned in our session. We've met people that were married that said their relationships two years later were so much better because of what they used in our discussions. We've had companies tell us, hey, you taught us about things that help us change our culture, but this is going to change our profits because we're going to have a healthier company because of this. So it's really powerful, the differences we get to see. Mike, how 
uh, virus uh, COVID-19 uh, effect on relationships because uh, majority of uh, people uh, now sitting at home and we are experiencing social distance, social uh, isolation. Yes. Uh, well, that's just it. What happens in these times is it can be very tough on relationships. And sometimes people can act out of their norm, and that can be dangerous and unhealthy. So they try to go overboard to overcompensate for not being with that person maybe. So what you want to do is what do you enjoy in your relationship? Do that via Skype. Do that via Zoom. Do that via whatever platform you want. But if you enjoy just hanging out and watching movies, do that together. If you enjoy just talking, do that together. And some people are like, yeah, but I can't touch. And that's true. So you have to explore ways that you can feel good about what that is for you, right? So some people might say, uh, now this isn't me saying this, but some people might say, hey, the two of them might be on the phone and, and talk about touching each other, and they might have fun with that. If these are two adults in respectful mutual relationships, we shouldn't in any way make them feel guilty about wanting to touch, Right. And so there shouldn't be guilt about touching their own body if that's some, uh, something they want to do. And so during these times, that's OK. What we want to avoid is using unhealthy outlets for that. Unhealthy outlets like pornography, where suddenly you wouldn't use porn. You're turning to porn all the time. And suddenly, because you're turning to porn, it's not about your relationship at all. This is all about now almost the addiction that porn can create that I need to be doing this, that I need to be doing that. And what's sad about that is you slowly get impacted by that porn or sometimes even quickly. So now when you do get back to your partner, you're comparing their body to what you saw on porn. You're comparing the sexual acts you engage in to what you saw on porn. And you're starting to think, well, this isn't the same and I like this. This is what was doing it for me. Look what you're doing to your relationship. You're killing it because you're comparing porn to your real life relationship. So that's a high, high risk situation that people should be very cautious of. And I'm not saying some people are like you saying, no, you shouldn't be able to watch porn. I'm saying you have to be aware of the lens. If you're going to watch it, you have to be aware of the lens you're watching it through. You have to be very aware of how it's impacting you and how it's impacting how you view intimacy, what feels good, how you view your partner. It can have impacts on all of that. Uh, great, Mike. Uh, Mike, uh, dating websites, uh, virtual dating, virtual life, virtual uh, sex can replace uh, our real feelings. No, and you just said the key word there is feelings and connections, right? So I talk about building mutually amazing relationships, right? And that's about connection. And so if somebody says I'm having a connection with a technological device, then what they're actually doing is having a connection with them, their a false personality of themselves or maybe a real personality of themselves. It's not with the device. It's with an alter ego because the device doesn't have a personality. There's no soul in a device. There's no such thing. There's no heart in a device. So if you tell me I have a connection with a robot, what you're telling me is you've created another personality from within you and you've planted it on that device and so you're having a relationship with yourself and you're using a device to do this. That's way more honest. Stop saying I'm in love with this piece of device or this robot or no, you're in love with yourself and you created this other self inside the robot. Right. And so that's the truth. It doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have a heart. And what's dangerous is you lose the ability to know what a real heart to heart connection is. By the way, I don't need to be with you to have a heart heart connection. I, in my profession, I travel all over the world doing this work. Some of my closest friends live 12 hours from me, 20 hours from me. I get to see them a couple times a year at most, at most, maybe not even for a whole year. It has no impact on our friendship because our friendship is not about having to physically be there. It's about what's in our hearts. It's about what's in our souls and in our minds and so this idea that you can't have a relationship when you can't be with someone is just completely false. What it tells us is you have a relationship only based on physicality because you don't have anything else. If you can't physically be with each other, that, that's a red flag. 
Now, when you have it all, when you have physical intimacy and you have love and you have heart, yeah, you're going to miss the physical intimacy part. You should still have the other parts. That's the key. Mike, uh, how intimacy transforming in our days? Yeah, well, what's happened is for many years, the world talked in what's called a heteronormative approach and still mainly does, which is a man does this, a woman does this. It did not account for men and men, women and women. It did not account for multiple discussions of gender and identity. And so now we are having those conversations and we still have a long ways to go. And because we're having those, intimacy is changing because now people are not stuck in roles. Now I don't have to think because I identify as this, this container, I have to do these certain things in this relationship. No, no, you don't. You're a human being who should have freedom of choice because you're a human being. You're an individual. So intimacy changes because now you have the right to say, no, I don't want to do that. Or yes, I do want to explore that because both of those have been taken away from people due to roles. Some people think, well, due to my role, I'm not allowed to show this side of me. Okay, that's a problem. Or due to my role, I'm not allowed to say yes to that. That would not look like my role. Well, that's a problem. Today, you get to explore all that and say, look, I love you, you love me, and I want us to be equals in how we decide things and how we move forward. What do you like? Here's what I like. Let's be able to be vulnerable and honest and not try to be a good man or a good woman. Try to be a good person right? and make it about being the person versus the roles. And so that's really transformed how intimacy can be treated going forward. We can have more openness, more honesty, more respect, more dignity. Uh, Michael, what uh, we are usually taking for granted in relationships and making love? Oh, great question, Alexander. Uh, people will take for granted a couple of things. One, that my partner, it's their job to please me is a mindset people can get. It's really dangerous because now you're saying they owe you. And somebody doesn't owe you sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy should occur when both partners equally want the sexual intimacy. They mutually want it. That's why we talk about the word mutual. If I'm in the mood and my partner's not, in no way should I be trying to get them in the mood. All right, that's not honoring their space and where they're at. If they're in the mood and I'm not, they should respect I'm not in the mood. This should happen when we're both in the mood. Now, if you're saying my partner's never in the mood, then you're going to want to explore that and find out why that is, right? There could be that that's how they're wired. They don't have sexual attraction. There are people who are asexual. But you two need to figure that journey out. But it shouldn't be done through guilt or coercion of you owe me this. That's a big assumption people have. They, they're either on one side or the other side of that. They're either over here going, you owe me, or they're over here going, I owe you. Because a lot of people think, well, because I'm in this role, I have to do this. Neither are correct. And so we want to remove those assumptions that you owe. You also want to remove assumptions that because my partner's a man or because my partner's a woman, they want this, purely based on gender. You want to throw that out and discover and explore you want to also eliminate assumptions because my partner likes this a lot, that they want it all the time. That could be a massive mistake that a lot of people make. They think, oh, when I do this, that drives my partner crazy or they love that in a positive. Uh, so I'm going to do that all the time. Well, they might not want it all the time. It might drive them crazy when they're in the mood for that. You want to throw out all assumptions and discover and explore with each other. Mike, uh, gender stereotypes types uh, still exist? Yes. Well, and that's what we talked about before. There are many people that think that as a man, this is what I'm supposed to do or what I'm supposed to get. As a woman, this is what I'm supposed to do or what I'm supposed to get or not get. A lot of people do think that way. And you, it's just obvious when I say that out loud how dangerous that is, because what it does is take away freedom. When I think I must, I have lost freedom. When I think I want to, we have freedom. And the difference in I must and I want to are, are dramatic. And we want things to happen when both want to, right? That's the key. The moment either is thinking I have to, we're in a bad, unhealthy gender role, and we don't want that to take place. So we want to bust the gender roles. We're not saying that if you're a guy and you're very masculine, you should feel guilty about that. Not at all. Be who you are. That's what, we, that's what we're actually saying. 
But don't get stuck because you're a guy thinking, I have to feel this way even when I don't. Not true. Or because I'm a woman, I have to feel this way even though I don't naturally. You don't. You're a human being first, always. Mike, uh, tell us, please, how positive outlook uh, look like after breakup? Ah, so when somebody breaks up, uh, how do you mean how to have a positive approach to that? I, yeah, gotta, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the way to do that is, and I'm going to assume here that this is not a relationship of violence or abuse, right? I'm going to say that you are two people breaking up. There was no harm being done physically, emotionally, spiritually. In that case, it can hurt. So I really want it to lead with gratitude because there's loss, right? You've lost something in your life that meant a lot to you. There was a big part of your life. So there's five stages of grief, right? And you can look the, anybody can look these up online, the five stages of grief. Look them up when you break up because you're going through them. Even if you're the one who broke up with the other person, you might be going through them because there's a loss in your life, right? And so understand those. Try to lead with gratitude. Try to come from a place of I'm grateful for all that I had and really understand that. Now, if somebody's coming from a place of violence or abuse, I want them to know that they deserve to be supported. So to find a support network, a support person, that could be therapy, a counselor, someone you feel safe talking with, a good friend, uh, to have that, you deserve that, and you shouldn't feel, and it's not that you shouldn't feel bad, because people say people should feel what they want to feel, but I don't want them to think that it's their fault for whatever somebody did to them that was harmful. That's really important for them to understand what the other person did that was wrong was their choice, and they did the wrong, not you. So I want you to release yourself of thinking something I did caused them to harm me. No, they chose to harm you. So that's their fault, and I want you to get the support to understand you deserve to always be respected, and that's so important. Uh, Mike? Is it possible to reach ideal family life uh, when both partners absolutely satisfied? When both partners what? Uh, absolutely satisfied uh, of their oh, relationship. Yeah. So can you have mutually amazing relationships? That's what you're asking. Yeah. So that's what we're all about. Yes. Can you actually build a relationship that's built on mutually amazing relationship? Yes. Here's the key, Alexander. It's not called perfect relationship. It's called mutually amazing relationship because there's no, when we say perfect, nobody does everything right all the time. What I would call a perfect relationship is when you're supporting each other, when you're building that mutually amazing relationship. That's perfect because it's perfect for the two of you. It's, it doesn't mean you are always right or they're always right or you never make mistakes or they never make mistakes. Part of a mutually amazing relationship is understanding we're human and we're fallible. And we make mistakes, and we're going to say the wrong thing sometimes. And we might hurt the other person sometimes with what we say, and we didn't mean to. doesn't make it okay. But to acknowledge that we're human in this experience, and that that's going to allow us to get to that mutually amazing relationship. Mutually amazing relationships have difficult times because they're real. They have tough conversations because they're real. Um, and that's really important to understand. This idea that people get in their heads that a perfect relationship means you never have disagreements, you never argue, uh, that means usually somebody's voice is not being honored. Because if you're never arguing, that means there's never disagreement. And it sounds like you're not two different human beings. Disagreeing is, is how we become better human beings, I believe. When mm -hmm. my wife challenges me, and sometimes it can hurt and it can be difficult, I usually come out of it a better person because it's what maybe I needed to hear, right? And so that process helps us grow. And it also helps the partner understand, oh, saying it that way was not the way to say it. So they're growing too because it hurt, and they don't want to do that either. So we're all growing through the process. Great, great. Uh, Mike, uh, how should parents uh, to help their uh, kids uh, to understand what is healthier relationships. Yeah, the one thing the parents can do as much as possible is role model a healthy relationship. Role model, give your kids choices. Say, honey, can I give you a hug? And if your child's like, I don't want a hug right now. Okay, honor their boundaries so they see that that's normal and expected. All right, and if you have a partner in your life, you have a spouse, say to them, may I give you a hug, may I give you a kiss? Let your kids watch you too. 
explore and honor each other's boundaries. It's so powerful. Talk to your kids about, I just don't want you to be in a relationship. I want you to learn how to build mutually amazing relationships. I want you to know that the second somebody says this word over here, this phrase to you, that's not okay. And that's not about you. That's about them. But you deserve to know that you don't have to be in that relationship and you can walk away. And it's healthier to walk away from a bad relationship than to just be in an unhealthy one. And a lot of kids struggle with that. They think, well, having a boyfriend is better than no boyfriend. Having a girlfriend is better than no girlfriend. Nope. Actually, not having one is way better than having an unhealthy one. And here's why. So it's teaching our kids. It's really important we do that. Mike, I, uh, how do you see the future of our relationships? I think we have a golden opportunity at this point in the world because people are exploring so many aspects of gender, identity, and roles to, to redefine relationships to a place that we talked about earlier being not focused on how gender, what my gender is and how we relate that way, mm -hmm. but instead who I am and who you are and allowing us to connect like never before. We have more people of all genders gaining their voice sexually and intimately This is beautiful, and I think where we're headed is awesome. We have a long ways to go. And, Alexander, you're probably aware throughout the world we have a long ways to go. The things you and I are discussing, there are many communities and cultures that, that are not having these conversations, and they don't even allow them. We've got a long ways to go. The, the good news is this is happening in certain parts of the world, and we can grow it from there. Uh, will we be more happy in family life, and sexual life in future? When we focus on building mutually amazing relationships, yes, we will. If we don't, no. If we're focused on just uh, how do I how do I get become successful, how do I get to this certain plateau, and people do that relationships with money, uh, that's not about mutuality, about others. That's about how I get somewhere or how I get this group somewhere versus mutually is you and I how we explore that together. We do that, we're going to have an amazing world ahead of us. Amazing future. Mike, what should people take away from our conversation? Uh, you know what? Take away from today, uh, am, what am I asking my partner? Am I asking them what they like, what they love, what struggles they have? Uh, do they feel safe being vulnerable with me? Take away exploring with each other. Really do that. At the same time, take away respecting their answers. So if they say, I don't like that, don't try to make them like that. Right? Respect their answer. Understand why and respect the answer. Likewise, expect them to respect your answers. So if they say, well, I really like it when you do this, but you don't want to do that, then you have to respect your own voice in knowing, no, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to do that. I know you like it, but I don't. And I so unlike it that I don't even want to do that for you at times every now and then because I just, it, it, for me, is just not comfortable. So you have to understand that. Honoring those boundaries. Those are the lessons we want people to take. Use your voice, listen, respect, and honor boundaries. Mike, thank you so much for joining to us today. Well, thank you for having me, Alexander. And for anybody listening or watching, you can find me at centerforrespect.com.